Welcome back to Shul Lights. Today, I'm so excited to bring to you the newest Hank light, the newest Noctagon from internationaloutdoor.com called the DM 1.12. Now, this guy is the ultimate dual channel light that Hank has released yet. This thing is set up for awesome flood and ultimate throw in one light. So let's take a look at what we got here. And first off, when I opened it up, I was really surprised that it came with a holster. So that's awesome. And, you know, Hank, his his uh, box is usually pretty just no muss, no fuss. And then he throws in a little baggie of a couple O-rings. And that's all you get. There's there's no instructions. You know, these lights run on Enduriel. And the assumption here is that you're going to be an enthusiast. And you're going to know how to use this interface. And I'm not covering Enduriel in this video. We're trying to make this succinct. Get right to it. The one I got here, you can take a look at the uh, box here. I got 4,000K SST20s. So what I wanted was I wanted the flood to be uh, high CRI, high output, and just kind of a nice neutral, you know, warmish neutral, so 4,000K. Um, and then for the middle, I went to the W1 Osram, so, you know, the, the smallest most intense emitter you can basically get in green. So we're going talking maximum, maximum throw, and then flood. Uh, you turn it on, you know, it's got a physical lockout right there, so I had it locked out. I got a green button, because why not match the uh, center emitter there. And notice that it does have the auxiliary lights that we've come to know from Hank's other lights, including the DM-11, so here's uh, the DM11, and uh, you can see it's got the same auxiliary lights in the back there. And, uh, you know, both the DM11 and this DM1.12 have the lighted switches, and you get to pick what color you want on that. The tubes between these are interchangeable. These are the exact same tubes. And you can also get this light with the optional new 26800 tube. Uh, I think it was like, um, I think it was like 10 bucks. I don't know. I'm not sure off the top of my head. It doesn't come with a battery. You got to source your own battery. Uh, right now, there's pretty much only two batteries you can get this large. Uh, the queen battery is the one most people have. There's another one I saw on Reddit. Um, they're both not as high performance as like a decent uh, 21700 would be. So if you're going to use, um, you know, like a Samsung or a Sony Murata or a Molicel, um, these are all going to be higher discharge and better performance than this uh, Queen Battery 26800. But I guess the thing you'd be going for with this is just runtime. These things are almost 7,000 milliamp hours. So that's uh, a really big battery there. And you uh, unscrew this, and this guy goes right on there like so. And some people prefer the look of this tube. They say it looks more flashlight-like. Uh, there's been a little bit of criticism of the look of this light. They say it was a little odd-looking. I found it much better looking in person than on uh, pictures or maybe video. So just know that, that when you get it, it looks kind of nice. For one thing, it's not as large as you might think. You can see here in my hand that maybe it's a little smaller than it looked online. I also think that this aesthetic of it being kind of, you know, from profile, kind of flat like this, and then kind of conical this way, uh, it makes a lot of sense in your hand. So let's talk about ergonomics for a second. When you're holding it, with the standard tube, your, your finger's going to go right on the button here. And notice that my other finger comes right around on the flat part. So if I were to hold it like this, so now, you know, I've got it on the conical part, this feels not great. So I can see why uh, this, this decision was made. And another thing I noticed was that when I was running this light a lot, a lot of the heat was centered up here, and a lot of it didn't really make it down into the button area. So I thought that was interesting because, you know, if you run a light like this, the, the heat from the emitters goes right into here, and you kind of feel it where your fingers are, you know, where you're holding the light. When I was holding it, I didn't feel it. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's just something I noticed. 
Um, let's also mention really quickly that this has the standard flashing pads right there that we've come to know from uh, Hank right there they are and so you can get firmware updates if you have the flash kit that's available from Hank's site with uh, at the time of release here this light has the K9.3 firmware the uh, the tint switching K9.3 uh, firmware the same one that you would find on this light right now let me let me speak to that for a second. This light, okay. So let, let's start with this. Second, let me start here. The nine point three was interesting. This was the first dual channel light that Hank had, and um, before the firmware update, you got one channel or the other. You couldn't put them both on at the same time. And I think what a lot of people did was, you know, in the nine emitter section in the middle here, people would go you know, high output, uh, maximum flood. And then typically people would put some Osrams in these outer three emitters. And, you know, it worked all right. Um, I've had a few and I was never in love with it. I mean, these, these little tiny TIR optics are, are really small. And so even with, you know, an Osram emitter, it doesn't kind of go as far as you want. And if you were to put something, let's say like a red or maybe UV in there, I guess that kind of works. That kind of works, but it's kind of a big light to be carrying for, I don't know. It, it never really worked fully for me, I guess, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, it, it's all right. It's all right, but it wasn't great. This light to me ha is the realization of what Hank was trying to do with this light. Now that you got this really large TIR in the middle here, I mean, the throw is incredible. So, you know, let's take a look at this. You went from nine emitters of flood to 12. And then instead of getting three little tiny emitters here and trying to, you know, do something with the flood there, now you get this big, large TIR that totally concentrates the beam. Very intense. And um, I, I just don't feel like the 9.3 really has a reason to be anymore. I feel like this has kind of superseded it in every way. I mean, somebody out there is probably going to find a reason for this, but uh, for me, this is the one now. Um, th this light, I mean, let, let's put it this way. Maybe this is a usage case. If you take a close look at this, you'll see that these optics look like the, um, let's see here if I can, there we go. You see these optics look like they have lines on them. Yeah, I actually popped these three Carclo uh, optics out and I put in, um, what are they called? Uh, uh, elliptical. That's right. Elliptical optics. So this is for my bike. So if you look at, uh, the table here, you can see that it's kind of long and spread out. See if I rotate it, you can see that. So, I mean, maybe there's some usage cases because, you know, you can't do that with this, this one right here because it's got the little single individual ones. So, uh, anyways, uh, also, let's take a look at the size. You can see that, I mean, these are very similar sized, right? So, I mean, it, it's bigger in diameter at the head, but height-wise, length-wise, kind of the same. Let's also take a look at, let's line these up here. Let's take a look at the DM11 next to it. Let's get these better on camera. Uh, you can, in fact, somebody remarked that the DM11 and the DM1.12 almost look like they came from the same CAD file, you know, the same kind of steps, same kind of everything, and then it just extends out. So uh, these are both smaller than they look, you know, look at my hand. These are smaller than they look in the pictures, and um, I, I do feel like the DM11 is literally just the center of this light. So if you want a smaller light and you want to go throw only, the DM11 is a really great light. If you want that dual channel action, then you'd go with this one. All right, let's take a look at it next to uh, a larger 21700 light. This is an Ace Beam L19. We're going to use this later when we do beam shots outside because I'm going to show you how this works like a thrower. And this L19 I have is basically maximum throw because it's a very large tier. You can see it's much larger than this TIR optic 
that's used in the middle here. Um, and this is uh, a, a green Osram as well. And AC is kind of tight-lipped about what emitter they use, but I believe this is the uh, 2.1. So it's the smaller one millimeter squared emitter like in here, but I think it's the HX size, which I don't think this one is. So uh, that just means a little more lumens. And also, I'll show you against uh, this Manker, uh, which is also green, and uh, that seems to be the same optic to me as well. Okay, so we'll go outside and do that later. Uh, Ergonox, is there anything I'm missing? Okay, well, let's talk about this. So the, the standard tubes fit between these two. As I said, you can get this 21, uh, I'm sorry, 26800 tube on there. Note that the tube on this light does not fit these two. So this is a completely different thread. So there's no interchangeability between the um, the K9.3 and the DM series. And also it's worth noting that on Hank's D4S V2, which also has a 26800 body tube, that this one will not fit on these either. So it looks very similar, but the threads, if you look at them, they're different. Uh, so just know that if you have a 26800 tube from the D4S V2, it will not work with this DM line. So Hank has those all different. Okay, let's talk about lumens. So I went with the SSD20 4000K because I wanted that high CRI, but I also wanted a lot of output. At the time that this was released, I asked Hank if I could get XPL highs, and he said no can do. I think he said that the XPL high domes would come in contact with the optic, and he really wanted space in there, probably just for durability. But um, so maybe he offers that now. But at the time, I went with the SSD 20s, which I think are very nice emitters. And let's take a look on the tube here. And I don't, you know, I got to be honest with you. When I heard, you know, 12 emitters, I'm thinking, wow, this thing's going to put out like a ton of light, right? Like just, just like what, 6,000, 7,000 lumens. Uh, it's not. Let's take a look and I'll, I'll kind of take in a little story here. So. We're mid-ramp here. We're about uh, you know, 220 lumens. Let me go ahead and double-click to turbo. And you see that it went just over 4,000 for a moment, and now it's dropping. Now, that battery that's in it right now is, I mean, it's, it's charged well, but it's not full. So I'm going to take one of these. I'll take this uh, Samsung 40T, and I'll throw it in there so that we can... Get, this one's right at 4.2 volts, just fresh off the charger. And let's take a look what we get. Now, remember that the way this works is, you know, you get what the lumens are at zero, but then ANSI, you got to wait 30 seconds. So let's, uh, so I got my stopwatch here. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, let's see here. Let's turn it on and double click. So you see it hit 42, uh, I don't know if you saw off the screen there, but it was at 4,200 lumens for a split second. And I'm looking at the stopwatch here. I'm about 10 seconds in, and we're going to wait for that ANSI. We're about 15 seconds. See, it's dropping very quickly. This is really typical of most of Hank's lights, to be honest. This is why we call them hot rods. They just have no sustain. And see, I'm under 2,000. And I just hit ANSI, I'm about 1,600. I double-clicked again, look at it, step down. So I just went up to 3,700. So it had stepped down probably due to heat. So, I mean, if I had uh, raised the thermal limit, uh, I didn't. This is totally stock. Maybe it would have sustained better. But um, but I guess my point is, is and let's see, how hot is this? Uh, it's not that hot. It's just a little warm. So, but my point is, is that when you first turn it on, double-click to turbo, you're going to get about, you know, CSOP 4,200 just for a moment, and then it stepped down. Uh, see, 3,800, okay? So I, I've seen mostly, with all these batteries here, about 4,300 at turn-on. 
And that was less than I expected. I, th I thought I was going to get higher. So I uh, put an email into Hank, asked him what's up, and this is what he told me. He said that, you know, if you're using SSD 20s, he was saying that the battery here can only put out so much amperage. And uh, for any of these guys, even though they say anywhere between, you know, 35, 45 amps continuous with resistance in the circuit and the driver and the emitters, you're going to get less. OK, and I used a clamp meter and I measured them uh, with the clamp meter and I got about 20 amps. 20 amps is what I was measuring at the tail cap. So let's see, you got 20 amps. Um, what he noted was that oh, the DM1.12 is going to get about one and a half amps per emitter because there's 12 of them. At one and a half amps, an SSD20 is going to get about 400 lumens. So, you know, 12 times 400 lumens, and then you're going to get take about 10% off that for optic glass loss. And you're going to get about 4,320 lumens, which is right what I'm getting. And I, I kind of, you know, at first I was I was taken aback by this because I was like, well, my D4V2 is getting almost 3,000, you know, something like 2,800 lumens. And it's only four emitters. Like, what gives? And then he noted, well, look, you know, you put an 18650 in there, you know, again, you're going to pull about 20 amps. So that's going to be about four amps per LED because, you know, 16 amps, uh, so, so some right there, 16, 20 amps. So 4.5, you know, 4.5 amps, 5 amps per LED. And if you look at the SST chart, again, that's 750 lumens per emitter. You add that 10% loss and you get 2,700 lumens, which is exactly what I'm seeing. So it's just, I guess what we're trying to say here is, the battery can only push so much, and when you have this many emitters, you're just not going to see a linear increase. You're not going to go whatever you know your KR4 or you know D4V2 does. You can't just go, oh, well, that's what four emitters does. This is twelve. Okay, multiply it. It doesn't work that way. Okay, but let's take a look at the center channel now. Let's take a look at it versus, let's say, the manker here. So these are uh, similar, you know, optics here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to click over to the green channel and then I'm going to turbo it. And you see I'm getting about, well, a little over 800 lumens at start. I'm just going to go at start for this. And let me switch the aperture out, put the aperture in for this guy. And... This is a fully charged battery as well. And let me turbo it. Let's see about 750. So I, I noticed that that center channel here is doing really well. So it's, it's a very good thrower. You know, without further ado, let's go out front. Let's take a look at it versus all these lights I was talking about. Okay, we're outside. Let's take a look at this DM1.12 against a bunch of other lights that I've handpicked to kind of show it off. Now, let's start with the floody channel. And so let me show you a D4 V2 here with four SST20s at 4,000. These are the same bin that Hank has in this light that he made for you. These are the FA3 bins. So here we go. So this is on turbo now. This is a D4 V2 on turbo. And it doesn't look like I'm quite making the uh, four palm trees in the back there okay so it don't, looks like i'm not making that but this is a good baseline for you so that's what the d4v2 looks like at about 2800 lumens okay here's the dm 1.12 and let's go to turbo see that's considerably brighter so i wouldn't say it's staggeringly brighter but it's definitely a brighter light again remember it's not quite the leap that i expected because of that issue of only having so much amperage from the one cell. But uh, it's definitely brighter than the little D4V2. Okay, so that's a cool flood option. Now let's take a look at the throw in the center. Here is the Manker MC13, which is a very similar light from the optic, and the Osram, which is a green W1. 
And you can see that I'm making those trees no problem. Let me just double check that I'm on turbo. I definitely was. Okay, so there's turbo. And you can see I'm getting those trees no problem. Now let's do the same thing on this light. And you can see exactly how similar they are. I mean, these are almost indistinguishable. Yeah, just making sure I'm on turbo and there's no step down. I mean, that's like basically the same light. Okay. So what you're noticing here is that, you know, lengthwise, these are similar. I mean, this is bigger. And this is an 18650 tube, so it's tinier than the 21700. But the 21700 will give you more runtime. So, I mean, I think Hank's got, a you know, a good, a good light here. I mean, it's got really good optics. And it's got the dual channel. This is the best dual channel light I've ever seen as far as combining flood and throw. But let's look at a much bigger light. Let's look at a Ace Beam L19 here. Now, this is a dedicated thrower. So all of a sudden, you know, you've got a light that's even larger than the DM 1.12, but it's dedicated to throw, and it's a green as well. And you can see that it is much brighter. But again, this is a one-trick pony, this... Uh, L19. This is all it does. I mean, so there's definitely something to be said for having a light where you can instantly go click, click, hold, and boom, you got usable high CRI white light. Now, I was measuring this light on my Sekonic meter inside. So I think that, you know, we should finish up the video by talking about the tint of the SST20s, but I won't spend a lot of time on it because you can choose whatever emitters you want. But let's go back inside and talk about the tint on the SST20s. Okay, so let's do a little white wall hunting here. First, let's take a look at SST20 5000Ks. And let me turn it down a bit. So this is a very green emitter. It's very above BBL. This is that K9.3 I was telling you about with the elliptical. That's why it's got that long, elongated beam. And now let's switch to the SST20 4K, and you can see how much more neutral it is. Very, very neutral. Took a look on the Sekonic. It was right on the zero of the Delta UV, right on the VBL. Now let's go ahead and bring into the mix some SW45K from Nietzsche, which is very rosy. Let's turn that down to about the same. And there you go, there's three emitters side by side. You can see green on the left, neutral in the center. And let me turn that last one back on and rosy over there on the right. So that's a good little visual representation of, you know, below, above and at BBL. Okay, so in summary, what do I think of this light? Well. I think it's the culmination of something that I've been trying to do for a long time with some other lights I've had from Hank. I think the K9.3 with its dual channels never kind of lived up to what I wanted. I never cared much about tint mixing and mixing CCTs. I always wanted flood and throw and I just couldn't make it happen with this host. Then along came the dual channel lights for the D4 V2 and the D4 SV2 and that was a really cool thing. I was able to kind of make it happen with this one. You got the flood and then you switch and you got the throw right there. And I was super excited about it in the D4 S V2 because it's got the bigger optic, it really gets throwy. But then the floody portion wasn't so floody and I ended up putting DC fix on it to enhance the flood. But ultimately you're only using two emitters out of the four at a time. So that's the downfall to this light. And then along comes the DM 1.12, and it really has just kind of scratched that itch for me. This is the light I was looking for all along. So, I mean, initially, you know, that 4,300 lumens at startup wasn't wowing me, but now that I realize that that's just basically what it's going to be when you have 12 emitters on one battery, it, it seems much more reasonable. And uh, this is a solid recommend if you are a dual channel enthusiast and you want flood and throw in one light. I really can't think of a better light right now than this one if you want both. So it's a solid recommend for me. 
Uh, I don't know that I would recommend this 26800 tube because one, you know, it's added cost and this is already a pricey light. Uh, you know, in some specs, this light's already about 150 bucks. And uh, then another thing is, you know, you got to find this battery. It's just a hard kind of battery shape to find. And then charging it is kind of a pain in the backside because uh, there's not a lot of chargers that fit it right now. And lastly, I don't know of any batteries in this format that match the amperage output of the 21700s, so you're going to lose performance. So I guess I am going to recommend this light for people that like dual channel flood and throw, and I would say stick with the 21700. All right, guys, thanks for sticking with me this long, and I will see you in the next review. Please don't forget to subscribe, hit that bell, and uh, feel free to comment down below. Tell me what kind of emitters you would get if you built one of these. What would you put for the flood? What would you put for the throw? See you later.